Hello, Sim7 community, uh, and welcome to today's special webinar. I am Julie Fox. I'm Global Director of Customer Success here at Sim7, and I am absolutely thrilled to have you guys here. Uh, first off, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. Uh, we know your time is valuable, and we promise to make the next around 60 minutes well worth it. Our end goal today is to give you an exclusive look into Inventoro and showcase the incredible value that it can bring to your business. Alongside me, literally right next to me, is Kevin Jones. He is the Global Manager of Customer Success here at Sin7, based out of Denver. We also have Redeem here, who is the co-founder of Inventoro. He is overseas in Prague. Um, and together, we'll be your hosts for this exciting session. Oh, I didn't even show you guys the pictures. Here's the pictures oh, of the us. Picture. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll go over to the agenda. So we will kick this off with... Um, talking through why Inventoro, understanding the motivation behind the acquisition. We'll also provide um, a capabilities demo. So Redeem will share his screen and actually give you guys kind of a behind the scenes look at the capabilities of, um, of Inventoro and really kind of that hands-on demonstration. Finally, we have some FAQs teed up. Um, if, if our Q&A, if our live Q&A is not full, well, we can always go to that of kind of here's the questions that we've been hearing from people. So we can definitely do that to address common questions about Inventoro. Otherwise, um, I really do encourage you guys to use the Q&A section on the bottom where you guys can submit your questions in real time as you're going. So as we're talking, as we're showing anything, if there's something that you feel like you need a little bit more look at, like a closer look at again, don't hesitate to ask a question. Um, we really, really enjoy hearing from you guys and understanding kind of what your use cases are and um, seeing kind of how this might work for you guys. So definitely use the Q&A section. Uh, one more thing, uh, here's a little bit of a teaser to keep things exciting. Um, all registrants today will receive an exclusive offer um, for the month of July, and we'll provide more details on kind of what that looks like um, later today in the conversation. As a reminder, again, plenty of time at the end so that we can go over your questions. That's really the purpose of being here. We want to be able to show you guys what Inventoro looks like, the value that it can provide, but we also want to be here to answer your questions because maybe somebody asked a question that somebody else didn't even know they had that question until they until they hear it from you. So please do not be shy. Please ask that uh, using the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into why we are so excited about Inventoro and how it's going to revolutionize inventory management. Over to you, Kevin. Perfect. So let's start off with just the, the basic question of why Inventoro? So when we think about Sin7, we think about first just what is our mission? And our mission really is just how do we help product sellers and how do we make product selling as easy as buying it? Right, we know that product selling is not a one a one shoe fits all. Right, when I think about when I go to the store, when I order something online, it's pretty simple. I can put something into the cart and I get it immediately. But you, as product sellers, it's not that simple. There's so many different scenarios. There's so many different workflows, and we know that. So we want to basically be able to streamline it. I've worked for Sin Seven now two years. I probably met most of you on this call, whether you're a partner or a client. You've probably seen me in some fashion. And over those two years, I've heard a lot of you ask, you know, where's your demand forecasting? Where's your demand planning, right? As a product seller, you have these unique challenges you're facing every day. And we, we started looking around and we said, wait, we have this really cool partner within our ecosystem. And it was a no brainer when we started thinking about Redeem and Tomas and Inventoro. So one of the really cool things as we try to make product selling easy, we have this ecosystem of partners. We've built an ecosystem of all of these partners, whether they are service partners who help us and come out, you know, really white tailor service and provide you SOPs and build out your business or a technology partner like Inventoro. So we said, you know what, let's partner with them and let's provide a business, these unprecedented inventory intelligence, which is gonna basically help these businesses that what you've been asking for unlock efficiencies Let's help them just outsmart, outsell, not sign their competition. So I look at this slide and I think back to what our CRO always says. This is Padlock's triangle. We think about Sin7, we're the inventory management, right? Our core competency is how do we manage your inventory and we're the bottom. We are that fundamental solution for managing and connecting your omni channels for selling. 
We then add inventory on top of that product intelligence, and you're going to get to gain those valuable insights, not just into what your products are doing, but across your entire chain of custody and your business, right? It's not just your winners and losers, which, you know, Redeem's going to talk about in a second. It's also just what can your marketing team do, right? If you start thinking about what products are outshining other products, your marketing team can go and spend dollars on those products. Maybe you even think about what products aren't outshining. Cool, marketing doesn't have to spend those dollars. You then start thinking about small, medium-sized businesses. You're gonna start making better decisions with the capital that you have, and you're going to save real money, and that's real results. Uh, we have some anecdotal stories that we'll share kind of later on, but like we are seeing real results from real clients right now. We've had hundreds of calls over the last couple of months, uh, and it's been really, really impactful. I think some of those clients are even on this call right now. Real, real results. So it's a, it's a really cool thing to watch this come together. And it's been really cool kind of watching us partner with Redeem. I got to meet him last August when we had our partner summit. Um, and it's been really cool getting to know him as he's kind of come on board here with C7. So Redeem, I turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um... And I'm glad that this slide is on because today we're going to be talking about exactly these three questions and why is it very, very hard to answer them, despite that they're very easy questions, right? And when we talk about forecasting, I mean, I get asked a lot about, uh, you know, how do we forecast? I mean, what's the, what's the secret recipe? I mean, how does the AI work and everything? And there's a lot of focus on, on that part. And... Uh, Clients want to be really informed about, you know, that sales forecasting, which I'm always happy to answer because if you have a sales forecasting product, one of the perks of the job is that you can talk about forecasting the whole day, basically, and <laughs> something I like to do. But the important part is that you need to have the ability to transform a sales forecast into an inventory forecast, right? I mean, I would assume that most of you uh, do some sort of forecasting, right? You might do it just in your head, or you might be doing, you might be running an Excel, right? Which does the forecasting for you. And I've seen a lot of these Excels, right? So somebody first comes to the organization, they set up an Excel, it takes them like a month to do it, and then it stays there for years. And this is how we forecast. And I'm talking about that sort of, complicated part of turning a sales forecast into an inventory forecast uh, when, you, when you're when you doing it in an Excel you typically apply a logic and I've seen this many times with, with, with clients like hey this is the average sort of monthly sale for the last year right let's multiply that by two or three and that's going to be our stock, you know, optimal stock of whatever we want, want to have, right? And whatever replenishment decisions you make, and it's the answer to the questions is what to replenish, when to replenish, and how much to replenish, all sort of are made on the notion of triple stock, like for everything. Right? But it is, I mean, it seems elaborate, and it, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong in the sentence, right? That would sort of, that would look that you're making a mistake because replenishment mistakes, they look invisible at the, at the beginning, right? They, you don't even notice it, you're making them, but only months after <laughs> you realize what sort of a bad decision you could have been done. Right? A replenishment uh, mistake leads to overstock, which is holding your cash, or it leads to a stock out, which is taking away your, your, your revenue. And when you make that decision, and you will only sort of realize the result of that decision in, in, in days and weeks to come. And you make that, if you, so if you, if you purchase on the basis of your Excel, like, hey, this is the double and this is what I'm going to do, you're very close to these mistakes. And when you're making those mistakes, there's no undo button in replenishment, right? Mm -hmm. You're always making a decision at a, at a, at a place and, and in time. And once you place that PO, the, the process starts and there's no stopping, right? The goods come. What do you do with them? Right. So the, the, 
I think the beauty of our system is that, you know, we've put actually even more effort and time into translating our sales forecast into the inventory forecast than we would probably do with the, with the whole sales forecasting part. There's a lot of sort of sales forecasting sort of tools out there. Some of them are very sort of naive or simple. Some of them are extremely elaborate enterprise level, right? But where they differ really is that it's the ability to take that information and turn it into a PO, right? And obviously as goods flow, uh, it does not have to only be a PO, right? It can be an internal transfer. You have your DC and you have your local let's say brick and mortar stores, or you have your sort of uh, docks around the country where you would sort of, you know, do your replenishment. So it's about getting those transfers right. And it's also about getting right your production, right? I mean, your production jobs are also kind of like replenishment, right? It's it's different type of replenishment because you produce it yourself, but somebody has to give the order to produce, right? And again, it's the same three questions. What to replenish? when to replenish, how much to replenish, right? So I'm just going to show you how. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to go ahead and give you, I think that's a good segue here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you to get an actual look at what this looks like in Inventorio. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm just going to show you how we answer those questions. Just going to get my screen organized. A whole lot of tabs, Redeem. <laughs> I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> Just kind of uh, shows how my brain works, right? Nothing that should be you know, <laughs> tabs done open. elsewhere. <laughs> All sorts of windows. I love it. <laughs> Don't recommend. Anyways, um, so this is our first sort of screen. It's the forecast screen. And uh, the, the what, what, what really changes in in the forecasting of, of that Excel sort of thing, when, when you take that, let's look at average sales and multiply it like, you know, you know, divided by months, and then you get an average. So your forecast is the same on any, any given day. Our forecast looks just a little bit like the stock exchange. I mean, I could, I could this is done by sort of month and month, so it, it doesn't sort of change as fast. But I can easily look at it from a granular like daily basis or weekly basis where it would sort of change a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, right? And that's the whole sort of start of the process of what is done differently is that if you forecast with all, every single month can be different in your sales, right? So, oh, sorry, for, for those of you who have never seen our app, the blue part is, is our forecast and the green part are your historical sales, right? So we forecast on with this variety of uh, of you know of sales velocity and we forecast it on a product level so each product gets to be forecasted alone and each product gets to be forecasted alone in every single warehouse it's sort of sales demand happens differently in each location and only when you sort of take this complexity of you know product and location the complexity multiplies, right? And and the differences of how a, a product can sell in Denver, whereas a, a product can sell in New York can be enormous, right? And what can be a top seller in, in Denver does not have to be a top seller in New York. And from our perspective, you have to be looking at the demand in the lowest possible location in order to answer those three questions right. Right. So the first thing is that you're breaking down the numbers and putting a forecast on the most sort of granular basis as possible. Because every time you do an average, every time you group your products together, every time you forecast for the whole company, regardless of location, you're taking a shortcut which can take you closer to that mistake I've been talking about. It's the mistake we're trying to avoid. Okay, so again, people like to talk about how do we forecast? Fair enough. I'm just going to answer how do we forecast. We forecast by applying 100 of forecasting algorithms that we use and we apply it to every single SKU and every single location. Now, the 
the the the algorithms are a mixture of you know i wouldn't say basic statistical methods but let's say university level statistical methods as well as these deep learning machine learning ais that that have the ability to to learn the data on a on an ai level right and then they produce 100 results. Like every single day, we produce 100 results for every single SKU in every single location. And we measure the results. Right? We measure which of the which of the uh, which of the forecasting algorithms had the highest highest uh, you know forecast accuracy. And whatever sort of forecasting algorithm wins, that's the algorithm that gets to forecast that particular SKU. So, you know, people brag about AI. Everything is AI these days, right? It's a popular thing, but we try to be clever on where do we use it and how do we use it. And we don't tell the system, like, use it at this and don't use it at that. We let the system decide for itself on the basis of measuring that forecast accuracy. The higher accurate you are, the less of a chance of a mistake you have. And an AI algorithm any AI algorithm out there needs big data, right? So our forecasting algorithms based on AI are good for items that sell a lot, right? That would be, uh, let, let's say, bread, right? You would sell it every day, you know, in, in, in enormous amounts and you, get, and you can feed the system with an enormous amount of data. And then you can run like a, a, an AI algorithm, which will probably win. But it does not have to be the case, right? So, so we use it when it makes sense. That's the important message that I'm trying to say over here. Use AI with caution. You don't have to sort of worry about how it's used with us because the system decides for your best. Right, so coming further on, on, the, on the accuracy. So we, we list the accuracy for you, right? So when, you wanna, when you're comparing you know, the tools out there, Ask them about forecast accuracy, and, and usually they don't want to show it. And I'm not going to speculate uh, on why would other sort of systems not want to show their forecast accuracy, because who am I to judge, right? But when they don't have the ability to answer or when, they, when they're reluctant to answer, it should be like a warning signal for you to say, hey, there's probably something dodgy happening over here, because forecast accuracy is a... Is an I is a is a number that's not only sort of interesting to the client. I mean, it's we don't show it only because it's 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 like reinforcement for you. Can you trust the system with which with its eighty percent forecast accuracy? We also use that number for the inventory forecasting part, which I'm going to uh, explain a little bit later. Right. So you can look at all the products that that you have in your portfolio, and you will get the forecast accuracy for each SKU in case you want to check, in case you want to be sort of, and so we're fully transparent with this. And again, this is recalculated every day. How do we recalculate it, right? So we forecast, we, we measure forecast accuracy based on actual sales. And we kind of hide a little bit of sales and compare it with our forecast in, in order to sort of to understand if we're forecasting right or not, simply saying. Good. Right. So this forecast accuracy is important because we need to understand the forecast inaccuracy to create something which we call buffer stock. Right. If you would have a theoretical system which would be 100% forecast accurate, which no system is like that, nowhere in the world, you would not need to create a buffer stock, right? Because you would know that uh, if... If I forecast that you're going to sell seven T-shirts tomorrow with 100% forecast accuracy, you are going to sell seven T-shirts tomorrow, right? But that's not how the world, you know, works, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like- Only anything... was that easy. Just, just say what we want to sell and sell exactly yeah. that number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be nice, right? But actually what happens is that it's seven sold plus minus something, right? It's it's actually, it's, going to, it's probably going to be six or eight, right? With forecast accuracy of 80%. So we don't have to worry about the six because we have stock, right? But we do have to worry about the eight. So what happens if we sell more than we forecast? 
right? We need to be prepared for that. We need to have a little bit of an extra stock above our forecast. So in order that we don't run out, why don't we want to run out? Because then we would have a stock out and stock outs are bad for business, right? There's not a positive stock out. There's no such thing as positive overstock, right? These are all negatives. So we, we calculate this buffer stock based on the accuracy. And we're also looking at lead time accuracy, right? So it, it takes, we're looking at your suppliers and we're looking at if they're staying true to their word of their lead time. So by design, by contract, they're supposed to come in 14 days, right? But actually they come seven days late, right? If they come seven days late and you're already counting on the goods to be at your warehouse, Right, then that's a problem, right? I mean, so the system kind of remembers this and orders a little bit of an extra seven day worth of stock in case they're late again, because they've been late so many times. That again, translates into this buffer stock. So how do you translate that sort of forecast into the replenishment? The st thing really starts with understanding what you forecast and doing a good job in calculating your buffer stock, because that's what you're going to order. Hey, Redeem, and there's what? also, go okay. on. I, we just had a question that came through that I yeah, don't want to wait till the end for this one because I think it's exactly on the topic that we're talking of through course. right now. Of course. Uh, Mike asked if the forecast accuracy is at a top level only or if you're able to review by product and location to see um, kind of what that would look like. Yeah, sort of like, you know, if you press show products over here, it would have skew, uh, by skew, it doesn't sort of it break said, down. You scroll over, I saw the accuracy there. So it then shows it by each of the things. Yeah. And it's okay. sort of going from most accurate to the least accurate. Love that. Okay. I, I think it's also important to say that, uh, you know, we forecast bottom up, uh, you know, uh, bottom up, middle out, and, and the third one is, uh, you know, from the top down, right? That means that we're forecasting each SKU from the perspective of the whole company, each SKU from the perspective of a location and each SKU belonging to each category, right? So let's say that we would see that the whole category of cool drinks is growing. Then we would apply that sort of rule or the algorithms would apply that rule to the, the whole category and would actually increase the forecast on a on a on an SKU that would not sort of otherwise grow, right? We're also sort of applying uh, like a deep learning uh, um, sort of a mechanism to the daily forecasts and how they've turned in, into the POs and if those POs were successful, right? So the, in other words, the more you use the system, the longer you use the system, the more it learns about you and the more accurate it becomes over time, right? Sort of the accuracy kind of increases as you work with it. But it, it, it's important to say that, you know, category forecasting is a big thing and how do you map categories and what sort of, what sort of, you know, categories you would use in Inventora or shall I say in Core or Omni will determine your forecast quite a lot. And, you know, I mean, that's obviously not a question for this session, but you know, as something to, to discuss during the onboarding uh, phase or during sort of the connection phase on how do you structure categories? I mean, I've seen customers who would do a good job in putting their categories right because in order to get forecasting done, you know, properly, you need to have them done from the perspective of demand. How does your end client understand your products to be grouped, right? Often people would would use the category field for their internal purposes, right? So this this would be like you know uh, new new items, or or it would be like you know um, what whatever cat. I, I just can't think of a good example now. But whatever sort of internal category you would be thinking, and you would put those products into those. That's not going to work because that's not how the end customer buys. These can be changed. These can be mapped, right? I mean, like if your data comes in sort of like with bad categories, we can work with that. Now, coming back to buffer stock. So how much buffer stock we, we actually put on, on SKU? Again, it's, SK, it's, it's different if it's a popular product, which we call a winner, or if it's a chaser, which is a less of a popular product, or if it's a loser. 
because the winners, they're like the VIPs, right? So they deserve more buffer stock, right? When I say more buffer stock, it actually puts a, a strain on your cash flow, right? Because it's going to order more, right? Because it wants to be, a, you know, almost 100% sure you're not going to have, a, you know, stock out. But it's worthwhile because we're, we're, we're treating that sort of extra buffer stock only on your VIPs, only on your best-selling products, the ones that create 80% of your business, right? Mm -hmm. It's 20% of the products that create 80% of your business. Okay. So that all sort of comes into the part of how do how do we forecast and how do we translate that into the three questions, right? You need to understand the logic of the buffers. You need to understand the categories. You need to understand all of these things put together to get that right. Now, before we move on, I also want to sort of stop, you know, for a moment on the inventory health report. So this is something that you'll see immediately when you connect your data. We're going to show you the potential of inventory for you. So it, it, it would have, you know, right now it says 96 product availability, which which means that there's 4% of stockouts, right? So 4% of your products are in a stockout. That stockout takes away $43,000 every month from your revenue. It's the money you do not make because it's the goods that you do not have. So you cannot sell them. Therefore, you cannot make that extra revenue. And the red number uh, shows you your access inventory. So this is your overstock. Now, we obviously help you try to get this green number to zero or turn this potential into actual revenue as much as possible. And we try to reduce the red number as much as possible, right, over time. The green number can be fixed very easily because, Julie, what do you do when you have a stock out, right? You just order the goods and you don't know, you no longer have a stock out, right? So that's easy. But when you have overstock, and it's the stuff that nobody wants to buy, which would actually be dead stock, right? So you don't solve that overnight, right? You have to think of strategies to, to eliminate it, or you just have to wait a long time before you sell out, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a, uh, there's a calculation that we've been doing, like to understand the, 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 the size of overstock and, uh, and the pain of an overstock of our clients. And we did a calculation, which, I think I'm going to put it into the product roadmap because it's a kind of a cool number and we call it days to optimum. So I'm just going to explain that. So we know what's your optimum level because we do it based on the forecasting, right? So we don't calculate your optimum level on the sort of your Excel sheet, you know, six times your average sales, right? You know, times two or whatever. We do it based on the forecast that we see. And we know the optimum level you're supposed to have to supply that demand, right? And then we would sort of look at your sales of the SKU and we would think, uh, so how many days of sales do you need to get to that optimum number, right? And we were thinking, okay, so this will be probably somewhere like, you know, going to a year maybe on sort of a lot of overstocked um, items. But the reality is that in many cases it was 10 years, 20 years, 40 years worth of overstock, right? So only just by waiting, you know, for this thing to happen can backfire because your overstock can be huge, right? And mm -hmm. the, the good thing about inventory is it, it doesn't give you all the sort of the answers on how to deal with this problem, but it gives you the visibility, right? I mean, if you show to the company, hey, we've got $800,000 worth of, cash in our inventory that's not moving right then suddenly you know this might become this might become an opportunity that the whole company goes after right i mean suddenly you can turn your head and say hey like why don't we focus on our overstock for a moment and stop you know i mean stop concentrating so much on our top sellers right and it's the kind of data that you know we we, we produce and will be sort of doing more and more and as we sort of progress with this acquisition uh you know on an institutional level we're going to put more and more of these results directly into the sin 7 sin 7 products right so you will see it in form of you know reports you will see it in form of automated suggestions you will see it in form of widgets you will see it in form of you know text telling you what to do like advice 
But before that, winners and losers. So I was talking about those VIPs, which are the winners, right? So again, you know, they create a lot of revenue. They create a lot of profit. And they also can usually take a lot of your stock value. So this is how your healthy stock would look like, right? So if you have winners, your top sellers, your chasers, still doing revenue, still doing profit, people still buy these, right? You, It's still worthwhile to have them. I, sorry, just, just make a side note. So a lot of people have asked me like, so why don't we just sell only winners, right? But that's not a winning strategy because customers like a large portfolio, right? So when they go in, there's a reason why people shop at Amazon because Amazon has everything, right? And you do not have to sort of go from shop to shop because their portfolio is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's kind of the same everywhere. People enjoy a big portfolio. So having chasers is good to attract a customer and to keep a customer and to keep them coming back because they know, I mean, it, you have things, right? <clears throat> and at the same time, when you're on the internet and, and you're an e-shop, chasers are typically your gateway to your website. Mm -hmm. So on a normal day, a customer would Google a chaser, but end up buying a winner, right? But they enter your website, you know, through Googling a chaser, right? So that's why it's important to have them. And then you have losers, which represent your dead stock. I mean, they do no revenue, no profit. I love the simplicity now, of the winners, chasers, and losers. I think it just, it makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and and again, you know, it's it's all about the visibility and, and and taking a very complicated field and sort of kind of showing it in three simple things, right? So these products are important, right? And you want to you want to show this to the whole company. It was like, guys, come over here. I want to show you something. These thirty three products, those are our kings, right? Sort of write them down, learn them by heart, right? Treat them with huge respect because that's where our money is, right? That's the sort of message you can now do because people kind of feel what are their top sellers. They don't really know. I mean, because again, this is site specific. But coming to stories, coming to sort of like, you know, how, how does it look like? So over here, we would have, you know, the stock value for winners being very high, right? Then you would have stock value for chasers being at 12% and almost no dead stock. I could only wish for all of you that your portfolio would look like this, but I saw overstock at 80%, right? <laughs> this can go... This can go. This can go sideways. This can be very, very painful, right? So, this ideal distribution of having a lot of winners, some chasers, and no losers is something that we will try to get you to there. Like you know, we that's why we exist, right? That's why we compute every day. That's why we do the forecasts like all the time to get there. Radim, how but, does Mentoro yes, determine what uh, what skew is a winner, chaser, or loser? Yes. Yes. So there's four ways how um, uh, um, Inventor chooses this, right? So in all cases, it's the ones that make the best sort of results in whatever sort of category you use get to be a winner, right? The ones that sort of create this 80% of revenue or whatever. So you can decide on, on a winner being the one that creates the highest revenue or a winner can be the one that creates the highest profit or it can be the one that's most popular with customers, or it can be the one that is sold in the biggest amounts, regardless of the number of customers who bought it. So these are the four strategies that you take, right? And whatever becomes a winner gets to get that VIP buffer stock, gets to get that you know little bit of extra on purchasing to make sure that you know stockouts never, ever, ever, ever happen on a winner, right? Because keeping chasers on a never, ever, ever, ever having a, a stock out would just be too expensive, right? I mean, the higher the possibility uh, of a no stock out, uh, the, the more expensive it gets. And the closer you get to 100, which you can get to 100, that's only theoretical, the more expensive it gets. So so for all of you geeks out there, the the, the service level for winners is 99.6% meaning that we're theoretically leaving a 0.4% chance that there'll be a stock out, right, on a winner. If we would take it from 99.6 uh, to 99.8, I mean, such a small sort of difference would probably increase the number of your 
inventory value by, let's say, 100%, right? It really sort of, that gets extreme the closer you get to 100, right? So 99.6 is something that we, we know is, is, is ideal for the value between, you know, uh, investment and, 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 and return on it. Chasers, oh, go yes, on. go on. So chasers is 95%, and that's what I wanted to say. So there's 5% chance of a stock up. Yes, a um, question. So I see here at the top where if you can drill down by warehouse, supplier, category, all that to be able to show what it looks like per each warehouse or supplier. Yeah. Is there a limit to how many warehouses you could include or that you can like have as part of this? No, no, no. I mean, you can have as many warehouses. I mean, this is more of a pricing question, right? Because if you're asking me on a on a machine level, no, there's no limit, right? It does create more and more complexity the more warehouses you have, right? Sure. Right now you see that there's 45 products in this demo data, right? With four warehouses. That's why the numbers don't add up. I mean, there's 33 winners, 97 chasers and 40 losers, which doesn't add up to 45 products. And the reason for that being is that it's warehouse specific, right? Mm -hmm. So again, what can be a winner in Denver can be a chaser in New York or any sort of location that's, you know, specific to your business, right? So good. I mean, all of this can be downloaded. You can look at the whole list. You can export it. You can use it for marketing. You can use it for business strategy. You can use it for uh, homepage development, right? You can use it for leaflets. You can use it for enormous amount of ways, right? And you can also use it to explain to your people what's important. You can filter this, right? You can use this for for let's say supplier management, right? So you'll fil filter this by supplier and you can go like, hey, let's look at China B. Like, so China B uh, doesn't do a lot of products and a bad example, but I'm <laughs> saying that you can you can be looking at your, your suppliers if they're actually sort of supplying your winners or, or chasers or losers. And you might as well sort of decide to end a cooperation with a supplier if, it, if the results are bad or you can, you can you can you can you know d make you know a stronger connection with your supplier if the results are good and there's many ways how you can sort of look at suppliers in our system altogether which will probably be a webinar on its own okay so i'm not reading the questions but is there anything sort of relevant to what I'm saying right now in the in the question? We've got some great questions. Um, so definitely thank you to everybody listening in that who have asked questions. Um, let's see here. You actually answered one as you were just talking about filtering by suppliers. So, so good job. Okay. Yeah, you you literally nailed that. <laughs> <Psych> <laughs> oh, you know what? Wesley asked a really good one. Um, that I feel like we've gotten this question before. How does Inventoro calculate uh, the bomb items? And will it know to forecast the small items that get assembled? So how does that work? Oh, good. Uh, so we 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 download all the sort of bombs from from Sin Seven products for Coro and Omni. So we know how things are assembled and in what amounts, right? So in we forecast how forecast sales of the final assemblies, right? Because that's how people buy them. That's the skew that people buy. But in replenishment, we would only sort of recommend to replenish the items that create the bomb, right? And in the replenishment, we would also sort of add up the supply of the of the item on its own and within the bundle as well, right? So you, the same item might appear in five different bundles and also be sold alone. And in all of those six cases, the, the, the sales will be added up and translate it into a replenishment recommendation. So it's the same with production, right? So you can use our system for planning production as we would sort of treat a, a production kit the same way as we would treat a bundle, understanding if you're, if you're producing something, what does it consist of? And we would translate that forecasted sales into a component replenishment plan. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, super helpful. Yes, sort of planning planning production with Inventor is again a webinar on its own, but definitely popular and definitely a field that we're going to extend more and more as we go down the line.
Good. We had a couple questions around kind of seasonality and periods of like out of stock, right? So I know there's there's a couple of things that you pinpoint when you talk about seasonality and inventory as well. Oh, sure, sure. So uh, the system has an automatic stockout detection to understand if you had a stockout in history, we will see that in sales. And we will we will know that we're not supposed to be sort of forecasting zero only because you had zero sales, because we will understand it was a stock out and we will kind of clean up the data before, before uh, we forecast, right? In terms of seasonalities, you know, there's different types of seasonalities that we learn and that we recognize and they're taken into account when forecasting, right? So you will see it over here. This is exactly the the moment of a seasonal seasonal item right so let's do this like let's say let's put in just like a product like beer which in this demo data is done on a highly seasonal item almost no sales here then you know christmas or whatever so you will see that in the forecast it, it repeats this peak right you know as as you should okay hope that answers the question Well, before yeah, so we when it comes to fully get over to Q&A, is there anything else that you'd like to show, uh, Redeem? Oh, yes, I need to show the replenishment page. But I mean, I think we're, we can be fast. I mean, there's obviously a lot of constraints that you can do before you come to replenishment. And, you know, the, the simple answer is, yes, it's possible, right? So lead times, yes, possible. Specific lead times to specific SKUs in specific locations, yes, possible. MOQs, yes, possible. Um, packing, yes, possible. Um, MOQs on a group of products, yes, possible. Can we do maximum, minimum order amount? Also possible. I mean, and I can go just on and on and on and on like that, right? So there's also warehouse structure, right? So we would understand if you have a DC where you receive goods and you do internal transfers from there, you could set that, you could set the hierarchy of warehouses in, in inventory and we would sort of propose either replenishments for the DC or transfers for those for those sort of internal sort of warehouse to warehouse locations, right? And you could put in a production warehouse in the middle of it as well. So all of this is sort of possible. It needs a little bit of tweaking or how we like to call it calibration, don't we? Right. So when you calibrate the system and sometimes I'm going to be honest, it takes a time, right? Especially when you have a complicated sort of uh, supply chain. I mean, you're non-standard. I mean, We've we've seen it all, right? And and we can we can we can change the system to work for you exactly how it should. Might take a, a day or a week or two. Good, but at the end of the day, you get the answer. You get what are we supposed to order, when are we supposed to order it, and how much are we supposed to order? And there you go. I mean, sort of the last thing, which because you know we need to go to Q and A. The last thing I'll say that we sort of prepare this list. You know, from this tactical point of view, like what do I need to do today to prevent my stockouts? Like, what is urgent? What is red? Right. And I'm going to show it to you what is red, right? But I can show you because we forecast ahead. I can show you the whole replenishment plan for the whole year, right? So I'm just going to quickly sort of do some things over here to set it up and to prove my point. So I'm just going to do order for the whole year. So you would see, I mean, I will show you the whole production, uh, not, not production, the whole purchasing plan for uh, for this SKU, right? So this is how much we're supposed to order now. This is how much like in a week. This is how much we'll be ordering in August. You see that the numbers change. It's a seasonal product, right? This is how much we'll be doing in September, October, right? And I can show you the whole thing. Like So you can prepare for Christmas today. Right, I will show you how your Christmas will look like in replenishment, because I see your forecast for Christmas already today. Right, so you can share this list, like you know, with your again your your coworkers, or you can share this list with your supplier. You can give them access to inventory to only see this list, and you can keep them in the loop because they need to apply their own forecasting. Right, to we're all connected in 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 one giant sort of supply chain, right? Sort of sharing that supply chain, sharing those forecasts is just a natural and a good thing to do, right? So yeah, that was the sort of last message I wanted to do before before sort of moving into Q and A. So I, I I hope I sort of went into detail on explaining 
how we do it, that we do it on a different sort of basis and sometimes leaving this world of, you know, Excel forecasting and applying the, the logic of algorithmic forecasting with us, you know, it, it can be painful for our organization. I mean, because you need to put your head around it, right? You need to start thinking about your inventory differently and your purchasing. But if you do, we will save you time. We will save you energy. We will save you money. We will help you make more money. And we will do it all in, in a way that you can spend all that sort of free space and time for your customers, for your suppliers, and to building relationships that help to your business to grow. There is not a single sort of point where we would say you, you, you can no longer sort of grow your business without algorithmic forecasting. But rest assured, each company has that moment and all big retail companies use algorithmic forecasting, right? So all businesses have that moment. They might have it in a different sort of spot, but at a certain point, turning your replenishment on a sort of a, I would say, semi-automatic sort of, you know, recommendation uh, uh, recommendation system would, is, is, is a must. It's no longer like, you know, an option if you want to. And this is the tool that will enable you to do that for a price that was, you know, some years ago unheard of for SMBs, right? So this would be, this used to cost millions of dollars, right? It would, this, this used to be only available for enterprise companies. And now we want to change that world, right? So that's why we're here. That's why we exist. And we're coming back to the vision that we kind of shared with you at the beginning, right? And I'm going to stop speaking because <laughs> I've been doing too much. <laughs> that's a lot, a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to start though. I'm, I'm going to jump in here and, and cut the line. I'm curious. <laughs> wow. I'm curious um, how long it takes for somebody to actually start using Inventoro in, in a way that kind of starts to bring them value. I know you mentioned that sometimes there are things that we need to do on the back end from like a calibration setup or set up, setting up warehouse hierarchy and all of that. In an instance where, I guess, what, what would the range be of how quickly could somebody start using Inventoro and kind of what does that range look like? Yeah. So, I mean, the second popular question that I get, you know, after how do you forecast is why did you sell your business and why did you sell it to Sin7, right? Sort of the, one of the perks of, selling your business to Sin7 and actually transforming your business to work with one specific software is that we get to improve this data connection a lot, right? For us, it's easier to bend the system only for Sin7 or primarily for Sin7. We work with others, obviously, but right now we're focusing on Sin7. We are part of that company. So, in, in, and, and the perks of it for the customer is that this process of setting up and this process of calibration is just much faster. And we're going, we're, we're, we're shortening it from like, you know, months to weeks to, to days, really, right? So mm -hmm. it depends on the complexity of your business. I mean, I just production companies would have it's probably the calibration process a little bit longer than, sure. than let's say, like a, an, an e-shop that doesn't have sort of anything complicated on it with one location to sell or something, right? So, but but it, it's it's very, very fast, right? Sort of the, the connection happens within a day. Uh you see the results immediately. We we try to take the setup away from you as much as possible. Uh, and and Julie's team has been remarkable in uh, in in sort of like you know helping customers to uh, to to onboard effectively and to start using the system. So I would say immediately, but this calibration process can can differ company to company. Not going to lie about that. You know some 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 are born complicated. Some are born straightforward. So whichever whichever part you belong to but okay. you know yeah every every yeah, everybody gets to you know reap the benefits of the business sooner or later sooner than later let's say okay, Kevin back to you um I think one of the questions we're getting a lot is just so this doesn't this kind of goes along with what Julie just asked, but what type of data are we feeding? What type of data are you bringing over from Sin7? Right? So when we connect that API and we think about the actual data that you're pulling, what is it? And what can we turn data sets off? And what what are you pulling when you connect that? Yeah, so we're looking at historical sales, which is the source of our forecasting. And we're looking at two years back. 
we're looking at two years back to learn seasonalities. Uh, we can work with less data than two years, but in order to learn seasonalities, we need two years. We, we download all your product data. We download all your warehouse data. We download all your purchase data and your items currently in transit. Uh, we learn everything we can about your suppliers. We learn everything we can about your categories. I hope that in the future, we'll also start downloading your promotion data, which uh, if I'm successful in my internal company lobbying, we'll get that sort of promotion data in Sin7 very soon. And we all download all those fields like in a, in a, in a bunch and on, on a daily basis, we do incrementals, what, what has changed, like what, what was sold in the past 24 hours or past two hours, we kind of think very, very often. And we only sort of download those, right? We also download your, your, your bundles, which have we've been talking about and all of these. So it's a lot of data that we do, right? But we need all of that data to feed into our machine and then the machine sort of produces the, the magic. And then we put the magic in front of your eyes in, 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 in a simple form that you can answer the three important questions. It's all about the three important questions, right? They so, might seem simple, but they're very, very hard. That's why Inventor exists. Let's, let's build on that. Say someone's been with us for 10 years. Would you take all 10 years of data or would you cut them off at that two-year mark? Would you want- No, no, no. We, we, we would sort of cut it off at that two year mark. We can take more. It doesn't it doesn't change anything, right? I mean, when we look at two years for forecasting, I would say that we put 70% of emphasis on last year and 30% emphasis on the year before. And then if you would give us one more year, it would be like 0 0.1 or something like, but it's in order to learn seasonalities, right? You need two years, right? Would sales channels influence anything, right? So say I sell through an e-commerce channel like Shopify, but I also sell wholesale. And because they're so drastically different, right? So e-commerce is every day, wholesale is maybe bi-monthly or even bi-annually. Would you be yeah. taking that data and could it influence my forecasting? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and, and often we take the B2B data even out from forecasting, right? So a lot of businesses that we work with kind of run a B2C operation and run a B2B operation. And then we forecast both of them separately, right? So we, 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 if, we, if we get it in the data and usually you would separate them by a warehouse, sometimes we would create an artificial warehouse to do so, right? To separate the data from one another. Uh, that we would forecast them separately and we would also have the ability to let's say mark like uh big orders right let's say if you're a b2b and you're you're like selling 10 15 16 18 a month or something and then somebody comes and buys two thousand right because it's like you know the king came or whatever right it's unexpected so we can kind of clean the data. We can tell the system, hey, this, you know, do not sort of replenish 2,000 more items only because we sold it last time. This is out of the ordinary, right? So you can do that. Or you can let the system kind of figure out on its own because it would usually cut out outliers as it's sort of natural sort of thing. But, but yeah, I mean, a very common, uh, you know, looking at sales channels. We also, and this is like, you know, this is for bigger companies, which would be, you know, producing a small number of SKUs. Like, let's say you're you're producing sodas. Like, you know, you would do six flavors and you would mm -hmm. distribute them across, you know, distributors to be then sold in shops, right? So you would have six SKUs that you sell and you would have 20 customers, distributors that would then sort of distribute it among the, you know, country. Very sort of common use case. In which sense we can forecast by the customer, right? So we can tweak the data so that like, you know, your Walmart sales will be separate, your, your uh, uh, I don't know, Costco sales will be separate. Like, everything will kind of be separate. So we'll show you like, you know, how much those customers will be ordering in the future. And again, we're going to translate that into the actual sort of warehouse send the replenishment. Is it just looking at the historical sales data or is it also looking at purchase orders that have been entered? It's looking at historical sales data. Okay. Right. And you said something earlier. I just want to make sure to clarify because we did get this asked a few times. You can decide 
if you want to exclude data, right, you have the ability to say, do not yeah. include this in what I yeah. want for yeah. instance. Yeah. 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 Yes. Awesome. So you can uh, do that on a sort of like, you know, I can, let's, let's say, exclude the whole warehouse, right? Yeah. Or I can exclude like just like one item, or I can just filter out one category and say, hey, don't do that, right? Or I can exclude like articles coming from one supplier. I mean, there's many sort of filtering sort of options that you can do and you can exclude and include. And there's different types of excluding as well, right? Sometimes customers want to forecast the item, but they don't want to replenish the item, right? So you can exclude it from replenishment, but keep it in forecasting. Perfect. As such, right. We are never going to get through all the questions. We only have yeah. three minutes left yeah. and there are still questions coming in. We can um, follow so, up though. We'll, we'll definitely, yeah, we definitely take them. Yeah, we follow up. So I was definitely going to say that. Um, I think we have time for probably one more question. Uh, so I'm going to make it kind of a big one that hopefully covers a few of the questions. Uh, then we will follow up. Then we'll kind of recap. Uh, the last question is really just around are there industries that this maybe helps, doesn't help, right? We had a question that came in really early on that this made me think about, right? They do basically a lot of pre-sales. So their business model is we, we buy a bunch of things. We then sell until they sell out and we never sell them again. We then do it. We keep doing it, right? Like would inventory work for that type of industry? Or like, are there industries like, then I think back to like the precious metals conversation we've had before with some clients, right? Like, are there industry specific or, you know, production? Yeah, I mean, or, they, I wouldn't uh, sort of recommend using inventor for that use case that you've kind of mentioned, right? Uh, and at the same time, you know, I would not recommend anybody to use use case, to use inventor and not think about the results. I mean, we are a whispering machine, right? I mean, we we help you make decisions. We're not here to make decisions for you, yep. right? So look at our results, use your brain to understand like, you know, is this something that we want to do or do I want to sort of apply my business strategy to it? I mean, like there's always tweaking, there's always sort of changes you can do. You're the owner, right? We're not, the inventor is not the owner of your business. But yeah, I mean, like if you sell one item and you only sell it until you run out and then you never buy it again, then, you know, inventor will not do a good job for you because the- you Yeah, know, of course, right? Yeah, I mean, what 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 would what would be like? You know, there's no no no. Sure. <laughs> but if you're buying components of an item, right? You're buying non-stock items, right? We talked about bonds. We talked about assemblies. That does work, right? Because we know oh, yeah. that we're going to go into a finished product. Um, oh, yeah. Right. But we are. We have one minute left, so I do want to kind of recap. I think the biggest takeaway is blame redeem. At the end of the day, right? <laughs> you just yell at him. No. Uh, I think the biggest thing is. Right, we when we think about Inventoro and our partnership, um, we're we're just really really excited, and everything that we showed you today is how Inventoro really just gives you an accurate, better a better understanding on how your business can look at what to replenish, when to replenish, and, and really just how to replenish. Um, Redeem gave you kind of an exclusive look at how forecasting your winners, your losers, how you can drill down to suppliers, to warehouses. There is a lot more questions that we will try to get answered or that we will follow up with. We will definitely answer. We will be sending this recording to everyone. Um, we will, this does connect to both Omni and Core. And we do have a special offer for anyone on this call. Uh, we are offering this uh, inventory three months at 50% off. If you are interested in pricing or getting a demo or learning about your own individual use case, uh, you can email us at customer success at seven7.com. Uh, like Redeem said, our team has been on calls with a bunch of our clients. We are happy to talk to you about your own individual needs. Uh, we can definitely show you how Inventoro can work for you. One person had asked about case studies, how clients are using it right now. We would also be happy to share some of that stuff with you because we do have some of those compiled also. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was great talking to all of you. Redeem, it was great seeing you again. Julie, Redeem, marketing team, and everyone that joined us. Thank you.